I recently covered the compounds SLU PP332 as well as 5 amino 1 MQ for their ability to upregulate metabolism and therefore fat loss, but even some potential longevity benefits as well. But I'm now covering them again as I've recently started a new cycle at different doses, and that's down to various different biomarkers. So I'm going to give you a quick overview on both of them and then go into areas to watch out for as well as dosing protocols. So starting with SLU PP332, it's classified as an estrogen related receptor agonist. So what it does is it upregulates alpha, beta and gamma of ERR. And then what that can do is upregulate uh, PGC1 alpha as well as beta. And what that does is stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis, the formation of young new healthy mitochondria. As mentioned in my previous video, in mice it's been shown to mimic the effects of exercise. Obviously if you're increasing PGC1 alpha expression, that's what it truly does. And this actually reflects in a study in uh, vitro with human cells, looking at uh, aged women, comparing fit women to unfit women. And the effects were like by using the SLU, actually did uh, mimic that. So down regulating things like there's a senescent cell marker, SAL beta gal. And as previously alluded to in mice, it seems to have different effects at various doses. So when you're looking at 100 milligrams per kilogram, that's where it can actually cause issues with the heart, increased uh, like mass of the heart. But at 50 milligrams, that's where a lot of the fat loss happens. And at 25 milligrams per kilo, there's a lot of anti-aging effects for the organs. So increased um, like stroke volume, ejection fraction in the heart, as well as like better kidney markers. Whereas at that 100 milligrams per kilo dose, liver enzymes actually increased in mice. And this is what I covered in my previous video. After doing my sleep cycle, my liver enzymes actually improved three out of four. And in particular, albumin jumped up massively by two points. And I actually saw this a year ago as well, jumped up by 1.8 points. So definitely a correlation there. And since my previous cycle, I went straight, went straight from uh, sloop into B-methyl, which can actually increase liver enzymes. And so I did pretty much a month later, I did another test just on albumin as well as my like hormonal panel. And albumin from the B-methyl cycle had dropped off by staggering at 2.6 points. And you think uh, there's nothing really much else has changed. And that's a big drop in albumin. And albumin is the most important one. When you look at mortality data, albumin is very very important it's like the second highest rated out of all the 12 clinical factors in the omic age it looks at 36 in total the most relevant for mortality it being a really good clock for predicting death and when you look at the 12 clinical factors albumin is like the second most important and by the time of this october 14th blood test i've been off b methyl for a week so the albumin likely would have been lower still and then looking at other markers uh, that m blood test a month before the October 14th, September 12th, many things had improved while being on a, an intense cycle of sloop. So that's something to take into account. Like um, previously, my red cell distribution width was way down low, and so I had to start supplementing folate in B12, which corrected that. And that's, as you saw in the aging, uh, those clinical factors, red cell distribution width is by a long shot, it's the most relevant. So yeah, these are things you need to be mindful of when doing things like sloop. If you're doing, you're increasing your methyl donor demand, then that can deplete your things like SAMe and then red cell distribution width can go up if you're not supplementing the right amounts of things you know, like B12 and folate. And referring back to the epigenetic test I did back on July 24th, I've done two cycles of sloop at this point and a couple of things were showing like ETF alpha, is very, very high in the 97th percentile. So what that's telling me is that my mitochondria are spinning fast, but the fuel can't keep up. So the a good analogy is like if you tune up an engine, remap it, and then you don't upgrade the fuel pump. And so when I go through the data, it's evident I'm deficient in both vitamins B2 and B5. So uh, B5 at the 45th percentile needs to really be the 95th percentile. The same with uh, B2, if that's at the 35th, that's nowhere near where I need to be, close to 100. And so, uh, yeah, I've got a bottleneck neck there where, you know, you've got these important things for coenzyme A synthesis, you know, transporting energy 
into the mitochondria, you know, that electron transport chain. You don't want any efficiency, inefficiencies there when you're running something like Sloop. And for this last minute cycle, I'm running it very similar to my previous one, which was 1,000 micrograms. This one I'm doing 750 micrograms. So still what I classify as more of an anti-aging dose, maybe with a little bit of performance. But with this cycle, because it's only over such a short period of time, I'm running it seven days a week. So the average over that week, uh, in my past one, I would do it I mean, only Monday to Friday when I exercise, but now I'm doing the weekend. So as an average over the week, even at the 750 micrograms, it still works out about the same as my past cycle at 1,000 micrograms. It means I still get a week off before that epigenetic test on November 10th because, yeah, you do want to have some time off for methylation patterns to normalize. If it's something like my that past drug I mentioned, B-methyl, which can make an extreme switch to glycolysis, which you'd need even more, like three weeks that kind of period off but yeah so hopefully my albumin should go back to normal I'm very happy I got it into 95th percentile in that past uh, July test and then uh, yeah let's see if my kidney metrics they normalize as well as uh, other things you know like um, even lung age and the VO2 max markers and with red cell distribution width normalizing between those two epigenetic tests this all should come together to really reverse my biological age and then looking at 5-amino-1-MQ next, so this is an NMT inhibitor, so nicotinamide N-methyltransferase. And interestingly, this, this goes up from obviously age, being obese, you know, if you've got a lot of visceral fat, you'll tend to see this number go up. But also on the flip side, if you do a lot of fasted exercise, that can also... Uh, drive up NMMT because your body's trying to preserve fat for energy, like especially if you're really low on body fat, it's like a protective mechanism. So having a very, very low, you know, like single digit, five, six, seven percent, that kind of region, that can actually, it's, there are some drawbacks to it because in evolutionary at times over that period, you know, we would go through periods of starvation or winter, for example. So you need fat to keep you warm, protect you. And so, yeah, that's why your body is a self-preservation mechanism there to try and preserve some fat for energy. Check out our 12 month rejuvenation program where every three months we look at 225 different bar markers and get your future vitality optimized. There's even a six month break clause if your situation was to change. I've heard a couple of people say about not taking MNN and taking just niacin, plain nerk, either the non-flushing or the flushing kind at a low dose, obviously, and doing that and with fasted exercise and you don't need the uh, MNN because you've got good NAD plus recycling in that pathway. Because if you're activating AMPK, your body's energy sensor, what that can do is help with NAD um, recycling. It can uh, upregulate NAMPT, that rate limiting enzyme, and just keep it in that uh, recycling pathway. But the drawback is, as I mentioned, NMMT. So I guess it depends on how deep you go into a fast with exercise. For myself, my last test on July 24th, my um, NMMT was at the 85th percentile. So not in the red zone, but way outside of optimal. You don't want to have it like at one or two percentile either. That's too low because it does have some cardioprotective effects like an anti-inflammatory. But when it's too high, then that can also be inflammatory as well, you know, like um, affecting like heart contractility and just, as I mentioned before, you know, increasing um, adipose tissue, like less of your, uh, that energy also it helps with nutrient partitioning as well. So less of it feeds the fat more to the muscle. Then of course there's other things that can indirectly raise NMMT. Say if you're depleted of SAMI. So like, uh, you know, if you're, as I found out, I was B12 and folate deficient a little bit. So I've corrected that between those two tests. And then also I found out I was uh, over supplementing spermidine, which yeah, that can put a de deplete you of SAMI as well and then drive up that red cell distribution with, as I found out. And then also, uh, you know, like I mentioned about niacin, just taking out a lot of that precursor that has the drawback of driving up 2PY, which is a marker of uh, NAD plus inefficiency. And it can, that again, can really drive up um, endothelial inflammation. And for nicotinamide, otherwise known as NAM in that cycle, at the 91st percentile, I'm clearly uh, not optimal. I'm over supplementing wanting to be in the 50th. Same with NR as well, which is balanced for me. So uh, I've actually dropped half of my niacin dose. I do the 
uh, nicotinic acid, the flushing kinds, I've dropped to 25 milligrams. So that should normalize that. And then my 2PY isn't actually too bad, that metabolite. But at the 45th, obviously, I want to get that lower still. And just before I jump onto dosing 5-amino, one honorable mention is EGCG from Green Tea. It's the most well-studied natural NMMT inhibitor. And that's something I consistently have. I get like an organic kind. And it comes up really strong when I brew it. And I was doing three cups a day. Like, well, it turns into three, like almost like three big cups if you like oat, brew it a couple of times. And then I've actually increased that to four bags a day. And yeah, just because obviously it's the 85th percentile. One thing to take into account, I did have five days off without the green tea before that test. Obviously, as I mentioned before, epigenetics is a long-term trend. So I might have only just changed it one or two percent. But yeah, that's still relevant. And EGCG, on the other hand, is also has loads of different health benefits you know being uh, like i've also got a little bit of high neuroinflammation and also egcg is a mild mild statin inhibitor you know that rate limiting protein that just stops your muscles from just growing forever again a protective mechanism which it can be upregulated myostatin if you put on a lot of muscle quickly just to protect yourself because you don't you're again from evolutionary times you don't want to carry too much muscle because it's a deplete on energy and obviously it gets to the point where your joints really struggle to move if they get too muscle wound as well moving on to dosing 5 amino 1 mq all my previous cycles over the last couple of years have just been a bare minimum of 50 milligrams i remember my first one actually just my energy levels are really consistent even though i work hard train hard in the morning in the evening i just have like smooth energy and then um yeah so recently upon discovering that uh, my nnmt expression is high or m1 mna signaling which drives that that uh, now i've upped it to 100 milligrams and i actually i've noticed that similar kind of feeling from my first cycle of five amino a couple of years ago and I remember that first one just interesting on my ab separation. It really started to come through on that first cycle. Just I struggled with getting any def- definition down the middle of my abs. And yeah, it did come through. During 2024, maybe I got a little bit too low with my body fat, around 4.9%. I could actually even feel it in my feet, the fat pads on my heels. And then, uh, yeah, facially and everything, I just looked a little bit depleted. And since then, over 2025, I'm around, running around four kilos heavier now, about 80 kilos. That's when fasted in the morning and I just feel like I look better. I'm probably, yeah, I'm running around 6% body fat now. And yeah, just the extra energy I'm noticing now. And then my cardio, I actually hit a record of 315 calories burned over 20 minutes. And I've got years worth of data. And yeah, I wasn't really expecting that from, because I did the cycle of b my cardio, it did, yeah, kind of peaked at 310. And yeah, I was expecting just to kind of like down regulate a little bit over this five amino cycle. And interestingly, I've hit a new record now. So now with the the sloop, in theory, it could actually increase. Yeah, like I say, I'm only doing the 750 micrograms and that's in the morning just before cardio at the same time with a five amino and let's just see if i get any synergy i like in that previous cycle in august i did i managed to get up to 308 and so i'm just this is just great coming together right before my biological age test true health test as well just trying to really optimize things get everything coming together glucose as well that's another factor. When I was in that previous cycle of the sleep, I noticed my glucose, I've been wearing a continuous monitor. I could actually even get a little bit hypo and glucose has been a very weak area of mine over the years. And so that's really good to see, just bordering, just touching hypo, which yeah, agreed it can be dangerous if you go too low with it. And that's where wearing a glucose monitor, if you're doing a lot of different things together to help with glucose tolerance, then it can be an advisable thing to do to wear a continuous glucose monitor. And I'm finding tracking those calories while doing that cross training for 20 minutes is a really like good predictor of how well recovered I am and then over long periods of time at my cardio. I mean, yeah, let's say like the WHOOP does give you an estimation of VO2 max, but you can artificially increase that just by say taking propanolol beta blocker, getting your resting heart rate low because it takes into account that as well as things like how much cardio you do a week which uh, yeah can that can be again impacted by something like a beta blocker because it limits your maximum heart rate 
But yeah, when it's monitoring that, resting heart rate, all these things coming together, HRV, yeah, that is very predictive. It just can also be just good recovery. And so by monitoring my cardio, because I'm blasting as hard as I can, I can't just keep on beating myself again and again. There's only so much you can do. And so when you actually do see improvements, then that is a good sign because, yeah, it's not just there's because I'm reading those the subtitles that really just gives it some stability because I'm not just going to absolutely just kill myself in a treadmill light up my throat with oxidative stress have a lot of mucus it gives me some balance in there because my brain is a limiting factor and those three cardio sessions a week are hard enough to push me but not um, enough to really drive up cortisol because that can be quite catabolic for the muscles and so just talking about where the, this cycle of five amino, uh, my previous ones, I've got them all from Swiss Chems, and this most recent one, I actually got them from Next Chems, which is under the same management. And yeah, I can definitely feel it. So yeah, I recommend it. And then I even opened up one of the capsules, and it's the same color, you know, that uh, dark orange color with that same taste. It's quite bitter with it. And then with the the Sloop, I got this from. Uh, Swiss chems this time and yeah so it's again it's they're both five amino is a bit more expensive so that's why I really recommend you do get your level of NMMT and yeah I'm going to be keeping a close eye on mine if it gets down too low then I won't run the five amino but if it's kind of in that borderline range you know like 30 40 percent and maybe I can just run it a bit longer term at a low dose for like a couple of months and then obviously have a little break before running my next epigenetic test. The reason why I'm not that keen on doing injections of 5-amino-1-MQ is when you look at rats, the bioavailability is coming in around 38%. So even if it was half that, that's still reasonable when comparing to injections. Sloop, on the other hand, can be more reasonably priced if you're doing it more with these anti-aging doses that I'm talking about. If you're really trying to push fat loss with it, going up you know, a few milligrams, it can get expensive depending how you get it, how you source it. And that's where I think doing something a bit more direct like retrotrutide, if you're really trying to burn fat, stimulate the metabolism, that's a better option. Or even doing a hybrid, you know, like doing a low dose of retrotrutide with the sloop, that's another option as well. I mean, my girlfriend actually did 500 micrograms of sloop, expecting it to really stimulate fat loss. And I'm explaining it to her, you know, when you compare it to mice doses, it's a really, it's a drop in the ocean, obviously. We know humans react differently to it, but that's something to take into account. Even potentially my HDL might increase. I have made great strides with improving it over the years, but there's still room for improvement. But then again, I've dropped my dose of niacin, which could have been helping. So I'm hoping the sloop will come in and just increase that good cholesterol. So if you like that video, then check out this one on SS31. This tetrapeptide helps restore cardiolipin, you know, in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, which then can boost electron transport chain efficiency. Thanks for watching. See you next time.